I love this testimony. Ryan says, I suffered with ulcerative colitis for 17 years and have taken over 45,000 pills. Over the years, try to combat the symptoms. I, I bought no grain, no pain, and I've been off meds for two years. How long did it take you, Ryan, to get to that level following no grain, no pain? I'd love to know that, and congratulations, and thanks for sharing. Um, Yeah, so a 93-year-old mother with Alzheimer's in the hospital, IV antibiotic drip for perforation in the small intestine. Other than IV antibiotics and surgery, do you know of any other intervention? No, that's an acute care situation, Diana. You gotta let the doctors do their work in an acute care environment like that. But, you know, you know, God willing, she, she makes a full recovery. You gotta get her diet changed if you don't want, I mean, my experience, the bowel perforation generally is, is poor diet. I mean, the diet is, is a big, big key part to that. Let's see. Would alcohol be considered the fourth macro? No, alcohol would be considered a poison um, that some people imbibe on to deal with and cope with reality and stress, but I wouldn't call it the fourth macro. That's, that's putting too much um, importance on it. Macronutrients are essential for human function and biology. Alcohol is not an essential. Some people would argue that, I think, but, um, but I would argue right back. Should we assess first to heal the gut before taking any vitamins or minerals in order to assess nutritional deficiency? No, um, that's called piecemealing, Melanie. This is what happens to a lot of people is they think, if I start by assessing the gut, or I start by fixing the adrenals, or I start by one thing, fill in the blank. Um, the body doesn't work in a vacuum where if you fix one thing, everything falls into place like a perfect domino. There's too many variables and there's too much, um, there's too much unpredictability. You have to start comprehensively. You, you start with the gut, you start with looking at nutrition, you start with looking at food, you start with looking at chemical exposures, and you do it all at the same time, and you address it all simultaneously. Because sometimes what happens, you can start with the gut, and let's just say you're, you're, you're doing some different diet changes to address the gut, but you're deficient. Let me just use one example, zinc deficiency as the example. Let's say you're zinc deficient. Your gut will never heal without zinc. And so if you try to fix your gut with diet change, but you don't have enough zinc, then your gut isn't going to correct. You're, you know, so you're stuck in this place, right? And, you, and that's where people get frustrated because they said, I did the gut program and it didn't work, but they didn't assess their nutrition simultaneously or address it. So it all has to be done simultaneously together. If it's not being done that way, whoever you're working with, whether you're doing it yourself or if you're working with a practitioner or a doctor, we call that piecemealing. Right, and piecemealing is the quickest way to go bankrupt and get very, very piss poor results. Just to be frank with you, a lot of people don't realize, and a lot of doctors are gun shy. They don't, they don't want to overwhelm a person. Again, they're putting, they're presuming that you as an individual would be overwhelmed if they gave you too much information in too short a period of time. And I think that's a terrible presumption to make. I think delivering the information is the most critical thing that a doctor can do to, to for their patients so that their patients have the capacity and the ability to make the decision that's right for them. And so to presume that a patient will or won't do something is the wrong approach, and, but a lot of doctors do it that way, and that's why so many people get piecemealed to death, not, not literally to death, but they just get piecemealed. You spend $500 on some supplements, you spend $500 on some testing, six months goes by, you're not feeling better, you tried that program, you tried this program, then you do some different testing, and you do some different testing, and it just, they kind of string you out or string you along, or you go from one to the other to the other, but nobody's ever real comprehensive. Like that's your sign that you're doing it wrong. And if that's what's happening to you, and if you're listening to this, even, uh, even if you're not the one that asked the question, that's called piecemealing and it never works. It always fails. I get it all the time in my practice. People come to me from all over the world where they've been piecemealed into, into um, a, a dark place, right? A really dark place. So you've, you've got to be comprehensive from the get-go. You can't piecemeal it. I, I mean, I, I wrote an entire chapter on that and no grain, no pain on how not to piecemeal. So 
Um, if, again, if you don't have a copy, go back and read it. How accurate are the digital weight and body fat scales um, that you would have in your bathroom? I, again, I think the Tanita scales are great. Um, as far as accuracy, are they more accurate than a pod that you could get in at a major university doing research, like a water pod? No. But I think for the, for the sake of consistently measuring, they do a good job. They may not get, let's say that you, you get on a scale like that and your body fat's 14% per the measurement. Those scales have a plus or minus deviation variance. And so you may not really be exactly 14% body fat. Maybe you're really 16% body fat. But if you're measuring consistently and the numbers coming down, then you have a way object to objectively measure yourself to know that you're making progress. What is antidepressor drugs do? Um, so, okay, what, what do antidepressants do to the body? I mean, mostly they just confuse it. Um, you know, there, there are times where antidepressants can be helpful for a person. Maybe some, you know, some people will get to a point where they're suicidal, and I think there's a place for that. Um, but I think as, as a whole, doctors too frequently try to use antidepressants to get patients out of their office and leave them alone. I mean, I'm gonna just put it bluntly. Um, a lot of times when a person is sick and a doctor doesn't understand why, they, they don't want to dig deeper. They don't have the capacity to dig deeper, so they would rather just run you off with an antidepressant and label you as a psych patient. And I think that's a bad move. I think most people, that's, that's why they're on those drugs. Um, that's not to say that they can't ever be useful or helpful, but again, most, I think, are on it for the wrong reasons. So I like this question. Gaia wants to know ideas of lunches to pack for teenage boys if gluten and grains are not an equation. Um, you know, I just ate earlier today. I had a roast. I had roast. I, I used glass Tupperware and I had roast and I had some sweet potato and some carrots um, packed away. And I have a floor heater that I use to heat my meals up, but um, that way I don't have to use a microwave. Not everybody has, you know, has has the time to, to use a floor heater, but um, heating it is another matter altogether. You can pack food, you can warm it up at home, and you can pack it in a thermal uh, type cooler to, to keep it warm for your children. But, you know, any, think of lunches as the same thing that you would think for dinner. I mean, for, you know, for my lunch yesterday, I had uh, chicken fajita meat with, uh, you know, with citrus juice and, and, and chopped peppers and onions and, um, and avocado. So, I mean, that, they're, they're, Think, I think where we get stuck is we want something that we can finger food into our mouth because that's what lunch has become in terms of the tradition. So we want like the sandwich idea or the finger food idea, like a bag of potato chips or something. And those are just, obviously they're, they're, they're horrible for you. So think of lunch as you would think of dinner. Think of lunch as an extension of leftovers from dinner the night before. That's typically what I eat for lunch. So whatever meat, vegetables, um, that you're consuming at dinner time, make enough that you can pack lunches for your kids. A lot of times kids will be like, you know, that's embarrassing, this is weird food, the other kids are eating, you know, junk food and garbage. There's a lot of social pressure at school for kids to eat trash, right? To eat fake food or, or what we like to call fruit. Um, way, the way my oldest son dealt with it uh, was pretty unique. He actually is, you know, he had, he had some of his, some of his friends were making fun of his school lunch and you know, I guess in this case, my son had the advantage because he was the fastest one on his soccer team, and um, and he was the high, he had the highest grades in his class. So you know, when people made fun of his lunch, he just said, "Look, I make better grades than you, so I'm smarter and I'm faster than you. So physically, my food must be doing something for me that yours isn't." And then what he what he kind of paraphrased and turned it around and said is, he says, "Look, I have real food. Bottom line is, I'm eating real food because my mom packs me lunch because she loves me. What's wrong with your mom?" And he really flipped the phrase around onto the other kids. And it wasn't really to insult them so much as it was just to say, leave me alone. My food is awesome because my mom cares about me. And I think if more parents taught their kids to do that, I think we would see kids understanding the value of food more in schoolhouses. But what we've really done is we've outsourced schools to educate our children about things they shouldn't be being educated. And we've outsourced school lunchrooms to feed our children the, the Franken foods um, and, and who is in control of that menu? I mean, it's, it's Coke, it's Pepsi, it's all these companies and corporations that are selling the nonsense to the schools at a cheap price. So they're basically 
taking your tax dollars to poison your children, both their minds and their bodies. And I think it's time as parents we recapture that by taking a stand against the schools and against the peer pressure that's unreasonable in the schools. Because if we always fall back on peer pressure, we don't want to make others feel uncomfortable for our needs. No, we don't. But we also don't want to be sick for the rest of our lives and, and doom ourselves to cancer, heart disease, because we don't want to make somebody else feel comfortable and face the truth. I think the time for progress uh, is now, and I think the time for truth is now, and we all have to, to speak our truths. Uh, let's see. Did I miss anything on there? Let's see. Oh, so Victoria's asking, when, when is our food sensitivity test coming out? We're, we're, we're dialing it in. We've got um, some final phases, and I'm hoping to have it out here by the end of first quarter this year. I was hoping to have it out by January. Just We had some kinks that we had to work out in logistics. So it, very, very close. So just be patient with me. Um, creatine, would it be more useful pre-workout? Pre no, post-workout, most useful post-workout within an hour after consumption or after a workout. <laughs> I feel very piecemeal. Thank you for the clarification. Good, good. That's the first step. And knowing you have the wrong doctor you're working with is if you feel very piecemeal. Um, run far and fast because... Ultimately, um, that, that's the way of, 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 we'll just say, resultless poverty. Um, let's see. Keep going down that left. Just uh, keep going down that left. How do you stop, I like this question, um, how do you stop carb cravings, Amy's asking. Um, if you're craving carbs, there's several reasons why people crave carbs, simple reasons. There are more than the ones I'm going to list to you, but these are very common. One is B vitamin deficiency. A lot of people crave carbs, are low in B vitamins, so maybe consider a B complex vitamin. Another reason is chromium deficiency, chromium, C-H-R-O-M-I-U-M, -I chromium. We can put a link up to those two, chromium and, and B vitamins. Um, those are two very common reasons why carbohydrate cravings are strong in individuals as they're changing their diet. And it's because you can't process carbohydrates into energy without B vitamins and chromium. And so what happens is you are eating the carbs, but you can't convert it to energy. And so you're storing it as fat possibly, and your body will send a message back to the brain that says, hey, we're not getting enough energy. We need more carbs to make energy. But again, you lack the biochemical nutrients necessary to do that energy conversion. Another reason we'll see um, common cravings is um, yeast overgrowth. A lot of people with yeast overgrowth will crave carbohydrates. Those are probably three of the top reasons that we see. So, so looking into those three areas might, might serve you, Amy. Elizabeth wants to know, what is uh, more important to know, your BMI, your body mass index, or your body weight? I think body mass index is a waste. My body mass index is, a, is so if, if you look at my body mass index, it's over 25. So on paper, if you didn't know me and, and you couldn't see me, you would look at me on paper and you would say, Dr. Osborne is obese. Uh, body mass index is very misleading in that way. Now, don't get me wrong, body weight is not any different in some aspects because you can have somebody who's, who weighs more than what you might think they should for their height, but because they're super muscled, they weigh more. Uh, muscle weighs more than fat, and so a lean but very muscled individual might weigh more and look obese, again, on paper with, with BMI or even through weight. I don't think I think if you're measuring something consistently, measure your body fat percentage. It's very inexpensive to do a body fat um, scale. And so if you're, if you're trying to measure a, a, a benchmark that you can follow consistently for a result, body, I don't think body mass index is it. I think body fat percentage is, is what you should be looking at. My thoughts on whey protein is most whey proteins are garbage. Um, because they're highly processed, denatured proteins, and so they're highly inflammatory. We see a lot of people on whey proteins that struggle with joint pain and inflammation, muscle pain and inflammation, 
I mean, there's no doubt there's the research on whey protein shows that you can recover from a workout using whey protein. But the problem with most of the whey proteins on the market is they're full of fillers and junk. And a lot of the dairy products that are being used to make the whey are, are from sick animals. So I'm not a fan of whey protein. I, we have something called ultra pure protein, which is a serum derived um, beef protein that I would recommend it's far superior to whey in terms of its, its outcomes and, and um, reliability, but also in terms of its health. Is it dangerous for Hashimoto's or, or um, is it dangerous for people with Hashimoto's to fast or do one meal a day? No, it's not dangerous. I, th I think it, part of it depends on how well your blood sugar is, is regulated. If it's not very well regulated, you might struggle with one meal a day, but I wouldn't call it dangerous. How do you test for toxins? Very deliberately, Kim. Um, there's a lot of different ways to test for toxins depending on which type of toxin we're talking about. There's not like one magical test that we wave a wand and say every toxin is tested if you just do this one thing. It's, it's a multitude of different things um, that we actually look at. Eye twitching, even while taking magnesium, you might also have a calcium deficiency, Ralda, so maybe take that calcium with magnesium simultaneously, CalMag. Um, Is there a chance of getting off of medicine? I'm, I'm post-ablative hypothyroid. Is there a chance of getting off of medicine when healing the gut? Yes, there is a chance. There's a very great chance. So my friend has an Asperger overweight and diabetic type 2. Um, I'm assuming you mean child. Um, what could be specific advice to, oh, maybe it's just your friend. What would be specific advice to him as an autistic spectrum person? He craves carbs and exercises every day. I mean, I wouldn't give him any different advice than I would give anyone else just because he's Asperger or on the spectrum. You know, he's probably on the spectrum to a certain extent. It's probably worse because of the way he's eating. So I give him honest advice. Um, but there's not like a magic pill there. I, I know a lot of at, people with Asperger or autistic diagnoses do really, really well on a gluten and dairy-free diet and a sugar-free diet. So I, I probably would say specifically start there. And, and if you notice improvements or changes or differences, then you, you, know, you keep going and, and get more specific along the way. I found amazing savory crepes at Costco made out of egg whites and cauliflower. I think that's just more of a comment. Make sure they're organic and make sure the egg whites are, um, you know, from pasture raised hens. So somebody's commenting about the whey. My whey has no fillers and is made from happy goats. Well, then, you know, if, as long as you're not allergic to dairy specifically, I, I don't have a problem with whey. Whey can be you know, a helpful thing. I think what's the, there's a nursery rhyme, Little Miss Muffet, right? Sat on her tuffet eating her curds and whey. Um, so, you know, whey can be helpful, but a lot of people are dairy reactive. So if you're not, I don't, I don't have a problem with it. Uh, go down on that. Okay. Best way to get rid of inflammation in the gut, how to get started. No grain, no pain. Christina, no grain, no pain. That's the best way. That's how to get started. Um, read the book first. Come back to, to my channel, watch a lot of our videos, and um, start working your way through the knowledge base because it's knowledge that's power, right? And if you're willing to get educated, then you can take action on that education, then you can change your life forever for the better. Don't let anybody tell you any differently. If they do, they're trying to sell you something or they're just liars or they're just uneducated and they're trying to make you do what they do because they don't want to feel bad because they're not healthy themselves and they want you to continue your course of poor health in an effort so they don't have to ask themselves the question, how do I need to make a change in my life? That's just the psychology of sick people sometimes. Okay, I think we got to wrap it up at 7.15 and um, I'm going to go home and eat some dinner. I hope you guys have a fantastic week. Thanks for tuning in to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Look, again, if you're new to the show, come visit me at glutenfreesociety.org. Make sure you sign up for our newsletter there. It's the one way we can ensure you won't uh, get censored and we can get information to you consistently into the future. I got two more notices from YouTube on videos that they 
censored from my channel this week, so it's, it's probably just a matter of time. The more I talk about truth, the more they don't like it. So um, if you want to keep hearing truth, make sure you're on my email list. Okay, we'll see you next week, same time, Monday night, 6 p.m. Central Standard for another episode. Take care. Hey, if you've got a functional medicine or health question that you'd like me to answer for you, make sure you send me an email, glutenology at gmail.com, and we'll do our best to create a video answer just for you. Have a great day.